Um, thanks, everyone, for staying around. And thanks for the, to the organizers for inviting me. It's a great audience. Um, so uh, this is a joint work with uh, Vaub Mirokni. We are both in Google New York, um, the research team. And uh, uh, so it's about randomized composable courses. We have heard about it. It's the same problem. I'll try to approach it in a different way. So what I'm going to cover is that, OK, so first of all, what's the motivation, which is kind of the same thing. And I'll talk about the framework at first before the optimization problem and explaining it. And I have a reason for that. And then I'll tell you why we should care about some modular functions. You don't need a reason for that anymore. And there are two algorithms, uh, two ways of solving this problem. One is simple, gives you just some constant factor. The second one is trying to get to the boundaries of uh, how much you can get, basically. Okay. So the problem is that, okay, you have big data. It doesn't fit in one machine. Okay. This is a problem that people have been thinking about for decades now. It is not just a problem that machine learning people have been interested in the last few, few years. <laughs> so you have seen things like sampling, sketching, mergeable summaries. These are mostly in the streaming models. Okay. So you see items, parts of your input. You don't need to keep everything. You come up with some, some summaries. Okay? And in some cases, the most related case is mergeable summaries, which means that if you partition the data in, let's say, two parts, in each part, I write down a summary of the data, and the other side the same. If I put these two summaries together, this merged summary is going to help me to solve the original um, optimization problem. Okay? So you should be able to merge them, and it should make sense. But we are going to use composable courses uh, defined by Indic et al. in this PODES paper. And uh, I'll show you what composable course it is. You can see it as a special case of mergeable summaries. So this is the whole framework. You have the input. There are n, let's say, items here. It's just too big to fit in one machine. So you select m, you, you send it to m machines. For now, Assume that these sets, T1 through Tm, are uh, form a random partitioning or just the worst case partitioning of the data. Okay? So I send Ti to machine I, and this machine is going to run some algorithm. They're all going to uh, run the same algorithm for now, and output some subset of the data. So, so Si is going to be a subset of Ti. That's why we talk about core sets. Core set is like, just a subset of the input. And it, this is like a filtering algorithm. You can see it as a filtering algorithm. And ideally, we want S to be a small, right? We don't want to keep everything. And one guarantee that we need, OK, so th th that gives us these selected items. Okay? Then we have to run probably another algorithm on these selected items and output the final solution. Okay? This works for many optimization problems. So this, this is a general framework to think about just to speed up uh, what you're dealing with. Now, this is a one, one parameter setting uh, related to deep Arnaud's question. So if you have M machine, if you restrict these SIs to have K items at most, so put a limit on them, then the space that you need is going to be the maximum of N over M and MK. Okay? It's so optimized for the number of machines equal to the square root of n over k. The space that you need is the square root of nk. So k doesn't need to be much smaller than a. Anything is smaller than n suffice. I mean, if it's polynomially smaller, then you need constant number of rounds. And since this is a, sorry about that. So since this is a core set, meaning si is a subset of ti, if you run this with map reduce, uh, Let's say now we can call it a classic distributed framework. You just put this in multiple rounds and run the same algorithm, filtering more and more <clears throat> and um, getting to the size that you need. And the algorithm, and actually I looked at the R result for this algorithm. We don't get like two to the number of rounds lost in the approximation factor. It's like two, or, uh, two times R. Like linear in the number of rounds, uh, at least for our algorithm. I don't know about the other algorithms. 
Okay, so this is the this is the general framework that I'm going to talk about. Any questions on this so far? Okay. You don't need to um, see this definition again. This is just the definition of submodular function, dif more diminishing returns, and the application. So this is the k-means application that Alina talked about, and the reduction in the k-median cost. That's the submodular function. So one advantage of uh, giving this talk at this time is that I don't need to spend too much time on this anymore. Uh, Yuri's talk, you see, you saw the sponsored search applications. I'm going to talk about. So this is basically for the search results, not the advertisements. So if you want to maximize, for example, various meanings of a word, or target different users, young people, old people, different categories, these are all submodular functions. Okay. And it makes uh, and it makes sense to apply this in these settings because already you can think about locality sensitive hashing algorithms to find these search results, which is very distributed already. So in each bucket of those locality sensitive hashing algorithms, you just need to uh, run this core set algorithm and find a smaller subset in advance before the query comes, which helps you a lot. Okay, so this is the problem that I want to solve. Okay. Uh, maximizing the submodular function given a cardinality constraint k, and it has applications I've already talked about data summarization and diversity in search. You can think about machine learning applications. Uh, nice paper of Mirza Soleiman and Paul. Uh, there is actually a journal version as well. So if you're interested, and I encourage you to do that to actually go and find out about this application since you're already working on submodular functions. It's a good idea to get a sense of what's going on. Um, okay, so let me give you an example of a core set to uh, get a better sense of what's going on. It's, it was defined originally, I guess, in geometric settings. So this, this is just an example that you have a set of points. You, find, you want to find the diameter, the furthest distance point. Okay? The idea is that I don't want to keep all points. I just keep the convex hull, these five points, and, I, and I'm sure that the diameter is preserved. I don't lose any uh, guarantee performance uh, in, in this transformation. So I reduce the input size, and I preserve the uh, performance. Okay? So that's the, that, that's the corset. Basically, we need, we need the corset to be a small, meaning this num the number of points that we keep should be at most something. And we call it alpha corset. If that optimization problem, f of s, that we are optimizing somehow, is preserved by at least an alpha factor. Okay, so alpha is something like, let's say, between 0 and 1 if you're talking about the maximization problem. Okay? So that's the general definition of uh, corset in this setting. There are many other definitions, so this is by no means uh, covering everything. So let's talk about composable corsets now, because that's what I promised you. So composable corset basically means that if I have an optimization problem, we want to find a size k subset of s, s and uh, maximize this submodular function or any other function. And for the universe, f sub k of n would be uh, the optimal solution, actually. I need this to actually define this corset. I, I call an algorithm alpha corset uh, if it has some good property for me, if it's a good filtering algorithm. And what it means is that whatever partition or collection of sets that you have, T1 through Tm, if you, the left-hand side is just too long, don't be scared of it, it's just the left-hand side is the optimum solution on the whole input. So if you look at, sorry, uh, the right-hand side, F sub K of T1 through Tm, is the optimum solution on the whole input. This is the whole input. Av T1, in general, Av Ti, is what algorithm returns on set ti. If, you, if I give ti to algorithm, it's going to return me al ti. Okay? So these are basically the selected sets. And I'm just saying that the optimum solution among the selected sets should be preserved by an alpha approximation. It doesn't give you the final solution yet. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But, um, but that's, um, that's the guarantee that we are looking for. 
So that's the definition of alpha uh, approximate alpha alpha approximate core set. And why do we care about these core sets in general? Well, the obvious application is the distributed application. We want to divide the input, solve the problem on each one, and then put them together and solve the or solve the final problem. So and we want to preserve the uh, the guarantees somehow. But uh, there are other applications as well. So for example, if you think about a streaming model, if you want to solve your problem in a streaming setting, you can think about dividing and partitioning the stream into m chunks. In each chunk, run this corset algorithm. Just keep the selected items and go on. It gives you the same space guarantees. So basically, when I, when I talk about that square root of n k, that's actually uh, the space limit that we get for a streaming algorithm just using this algorithm uh, if we have a random order assumption. And I talked about the nearest neighbor search problems, local sensitive hashing, and those stuff. Okay, courses have been uh, applied before, and in particular recently in, the, in other machine learning problems, k means k median in diversity coverage and distributed balanced clustering as well. These are just some examples. OK, so the most related work, uh, previous work to, to our work was uh, Kumar et al's uh, kind of streaming and map reduce algorithm. And just the, in the best case, you can think about generalizing that algorithm and get a one half approximation, but you're going to get more than constant number of rounds. And I care about constant round number of rounds because these rounds are going to give you a, a, a very large overhead in practice. When you run these algorithms, it, it adds to the complexity and it adds uh, significantly to the drawing time. So two, like the minimum is very much preferable. Maybe just a, a small constant is OK. The, the more it's going to affect uh, practicality. Who has three rounds? Yeah, but uh, but they they don't get one half or they have an overhead. There is one of these two cases. First of all, they, in their paper, they don't mention any of these results. Uh, what they worked out, what they personally worked out, uh, I I could find found this, and I've I've actually been in touch with uh, Sergey. At least he's a colleague of mine, so he has confirmed with me this. Uh, but if you have more accurate information, I would be happy to talk to you after. Um, so, so what we are trying to do seems impossible because of this hardness result, uh, that there is no better than 1 over square root k uh, approximation uh, using this framework, composable core set for submodular maximization. And the reason is that it's worst case. You have seen the reason there. So. But what we try to use a random partitioning and get a result. And in the random partitioning, we just care about the expected value uh, that we get using our algorithm. Okay. So this is our first result that I uh, uh, talked about. So if you partition the data into uh, different parts, run algorithm greedy, you get one third. And one third is like the best k subset of these selected items, it doesn't mean that it gives you that k items. Okay? So if you're, you need to run another algorithm here, if you run greedy again, you get 1 minus 1 over 8 times 1 third. Okay? That's actually pretty small. But we can improve the analysis. And uh, with the same greedy algorithm, a, a better analysis, get 27%. What we actually show is a bit more general about the general class of algorithms, and I'm going to talk about that in, in like two slides. Let me go over all results. So that's the one third, just simple monotone sub, for sub, monotone submodular. It's a slightly worse for non-monotone submodular. Okay. And uh, the hardness is that it's kind of something like this. If you restrict the course at sizes to k. What are the corset sizes? These size, uh, the maximum size of these SIs. If you just return k items in the first round, 
greedy and locally optimal algorithms are not going to give you anything better than one half. Okay, so that's. But even if you do, if you return more than k items, if you, if you have some overhead, whatever you do, there is an information theoretic uh, upper bound of 1 minus 1 over e on the, um, on the approximation of the courses. And this is different from the 1 minus 1 over e hardness result of submodular maximization. This is talking about filtering your input, giving some subset that preserves the result. This is a much stronger hardness result than that one. It's, and it's information theoretic. Okay? So what should we do to get a better bound? We return 4k items. It's actually 2 plus a square root 2. I just write 4 here. And we get 58% approximate core set. That's actually 2 minus a square root 2. And the final distributed approximation that we get is slightly worse than 58, it's like 54%. So in general, we beat the one half approximation factor, and that's what we get. Okay. And for a small size core set, I, uh, I don't uh, talk about that. And there is no need uh, to say that Barbosa at all. You saw the talk. Uh, independently work on this problem and prove that greedy gets 31%. The 31% that I'm talking about here is half of 1 minus 1 over e, the best guarantee that we know for greedy. The input has some better structure, greedy works better, they get better. So when I talk about 58%, I'm saying that there exists a good solution among the selected items with 58% guarantee. And there is another algorithm, it's actually not greedy, it's inspired by greedy, and you get 50%. 54%. Okay. Um, okay. I think I have uh, around 10 minutes. So I'll spend like five minutes on each of these results, technical parts. And hopefully I can cover uh, most of it. Okay. But before that, I want to mention so, so, so here is uh, my two cents to this workshop. Uh, if you want to work on an algorithm or it's, it's just a good idea to, be, to have a robust analysis, meaning if you can analyze a general class of algorithms, please do that. Because, um, I mean, if you would like your algorithm to be used later on. The reason is that for practical purposes, people are not going to read a paper and implement the same result, right? Because they observe some special structure in the data, and based on that, they they want to do a special things. So, uh, so it's a good idea to be robust in that sense. But another thing is that even in the theory community, if we have an algorithm, we want to make it faster, we get a better result, we get a better approximation factor, or we lose some approximation factor, and we get some speed up. Uh, we don't want to do the whole distributed analysis from, from scratch, right? So one, one example of that is like greedy algorithm and lazier than lazy greedy algorithm work of Yon uh, Wondrak et al. Okay. So it's a good idea to be flexible in that sense and, and give some knobs to the engineers so they can play with it. So let me move to the family of algorithms that I'm talking about. And my claim is that for all these family, we get some guarantee, some good guarantee. The family is this. Algorithm is better nice if it has two properties. The first one is very similar, and I think a bit simpler uh, than the property that Alina talked about. The whole idea is that if you give set t to algorithm alt, it returns alt t. Okay. If if x is in set t but it's not selected by algorithm alt, it's discarded. It's then it means that if we remove x from the beginning, the outcome of the algorithm should not change. Okay? Uh, the outcome should not depend on the items when, that were not selected. The other property is that the marginal value of every item that was not selected should not be more than beta times the average contribution of the selected items. That's the second property. So for example, greedy is one nice. Lazier. Uh, uh, there, there, are, there are faster versions of greedy, which are 1 plus epsilon nice. Okay. So many algorithms actually fit in this framework, but not all of them. 
And when I talk about delta of x and a, I mean just the marginal value of adding x to a this, this time. Okay. So that's the family, and this is the result. The result is that any beta nice algorithm is 1 over 2 plus beta approximate corset. Okay. So greedy, for greedy beta is 1, you get 1 third. And for non-monotone, it's slightly worse. That M is the number of machines. Okay. If you want to get rid of the number of machines, it's easy. Just because if, if the number of machines is a small, you already have a good, con, uh, good fraction of optimum in one of the machines. OK? Um, I don't need to go over algorithm greedy. Actually, I uh, show that later. So this is what I'm going to show you, the one-third approximation. And uh, let me just show you what the greedy analysis, basically. Okay. So this is the optimum solution. Okay. The optimum solution has seven columns. Each column is an item. The value of each item is basically the area it covers. So this blue area is, uh, is, is the value of that item. So the whole universe, you can think about it as this square, the whole square. This is, by the way, a square to me. And it's going to be. I mean, Please assume that it's a square. So the width is like 1 here. So greedy selects the first item. It's actually a row, 1 plus epsilon width, so better than the rest. The second item does not, to be selected, does not need to be that wide, because it has to be comparable to the remaining blue area. Okay. So it's a slightly worse. And if you continue this, you get this geometric, uh, um, geometric series of uh, widths. And you continue, and at the end, after picking k items, you get 1 minus 1 over e. Because you get lower and lower, and at the end, you can compute it, and it gives you 1 minus 1 over e. It gives you a function of k that approaches 1 minus 1 over e as k goes to infinity. Okay? So that's the, that's the general uh, analysis that we talk about. Now, for, for beta nice algorithms, I mean, in, in general, in this distributed setting, the situation is different because we don't have access to opt. But we have something. So let's say, let's think about machine i. Yes, set ti outputs si. Okay. There is an optimum solution. We do this test. Based on what machine i does, we partition opt into two sets, opt si and opt ns. Which are supposed to be selected in perspective of machine i and not selected in perspective of machine i. This is the test. That for every x in opt, I send it to machine i, takes the union, and we look at the algorithm. If it's selected, we also put it in opt si. If it's not selected, if it's discarded, we put it in opt nsi. So it's like a partitioning from perspective of machine i. First thing to note that is that this opt NSI is a, gives you a lower bound on the performance of machine I. So f of SI, what SI actually chooses, chooses is at least 1 minus 1 over times the value of this set. Why? Because these are the guys that were not selected by machine I. So if they, we add them to TI, the outcome should not change. If you add them to TI, basically it means that algorithm, now, now in the analysis, you can compare to yourself to opt NSI. Okay. Get the same classic greedy analysis. Okay. So if this is good, I'm good. I get a constant approximation. The other case is that, well, if this is not good, if, if this is only 10% of opt, this should be like 90% of opt. Okay. We are talking about sub-added functions here. Sub-modular, special case of sub -added. So as an observation, if opt s of i is the subset of selected items. So this opt s is the actual set of selected items. If this is actually, if this set is a, if they are all actually selected in my framework, then I'm done. Because this has a good value, therefore the selected items of optimum have, uh, have good value as well, and then I get a constant approximation. Okay? This is the foundation of what gives us the 58% approximation. So if I find time, I come back to this later. Otherwise, it's just an intuition of the starting point to, to get to that. But in general, you don't know this. It's not necessarily true. 
There is a trick to make it work. Um, so in general, we have a separate partition, which is opt-s and opt-ns, the selected and not selected items. Okay. We want to say that the maximum of opt-s and these sets returned by the machines gives us actually a good value. They're, they're, they give you a constant approximation. How do we do this? Well, these opt-s, if this is good, then we are done. So therefore, the other set has a good value. The other set consists of items X that were sent to some machine TI, but were not selected in SI. So why, why, were, why, why didn't we select them? Because their marginal value to SI was a small. Okay. That's the second property in the betonized family that I'm talking about. So if their marginal value is a small, there are at most k of them, so the sum of these marginal values is at most maximum of f of psi. Okay. But the problem is that I have to prove that their marginal and contribution value in the optimum solution is a small. It's a different thing. So their marginal value in SI is a small, but I care about their marginal value in the optimum solution. So there is another. I have to bound this gap. Delta of x and SI and contribution of x in up I'm going to talk about this contribution in a minute. But the only thing that now that I have to prove is that this difference is bound. I know. That's all. Okay. Any questions up to this point? We need two more minutes to complete at least this part of the proof. And I think I have it. Um, okay. So, um, so this is the contribution. You take an arbitrary permutation of optimum items, x1 through xk. You define items before x in the permutation to be opt sub x. Okay. The contribution of x is basically the marginal value of adding x to opt x. Basically saying that based on these permutations, add items one by one and look at the marginal values. That's the contribution that I'm defining here, arbitrary permutation. Two things to note. Some of these marginal values, these contributions, give you f of opt. That's obvious. You start from empty set, you end up, up at the optimum set. And for any set A, if you look at the marginal values of x and A union opt x, it's like you started from A and you ended up at A union opt. The same ideas. Instead of empty set, you started at A. These are the two things I'm going to use. So I, I wanted to bound this difference. By submodularity, I can add something to SI here. It reduces the margin value. If I sum them up for all x in opt, the first sum is going to give me f of opt. The second sum, this SI is basically the A that I just talked about. Gives me this difference. By monotonicity, I get f of SI. Making it work for non-monotony is not a big deal. So I have to, in worst case, take the sum for all i, which means that I have an upper bound of f of si, sum of f of si. Sum of f of si is not a good bound. Because it basically means that your approximation factor is 1 over m. Because each of these guys could be f op divided by m, and then you have a very pretty loose upper bound here. But in random order, we prove, what we prove is that each of these terms become relevant only with probability 1 over m. That's the 1 over m factor that we get. So at the end, we have three terms, f of opt s, the maximum that I talked about in the previous slide, and the average that I have here. These three upper bound f of opt, so one of them should be good. Okay? I'll stop at this point, but let me give me just one minute for conclusion if I have time. So these are the parts that uh, didn't find time to cover. If you have questions about the other algorithm, the, the other results, please let me know. I'll explain it to you later. Um, these are the remarks. So I talked about the robust analysis, just making your analysis work for a family of algorithm, if possible. Um, one question is that whether we can get a 1 minus 1 over E approximation with two rounds and uh, with larger core sets. Because overhead, 
uh, in the second round is much more preferable than increasing the number of rounds. Uh, Grida is basically the distributed greedy algorithm that uh, Mirza Soleiman et al. implement. One thing is that we'd, when, when, we, we, when we implement these results, we com when we compare them in actual data sets, sometimes we, we have some idea of what's the optimum solution, but most of the time we don't know. What we do is that in, uh, for, for days we may run an algorithm and run greedy algorithm and see what's the result in one single machine, then compare the distributed version with the single machine version. Okay. If that's what we're going to do, so why not actually see what, what the mathematics is behind it? So let's say your benchmark is greedy. How much is your approximation? Can you, for example, prove that you always get 90% of greedy? 90% of uh, what greedy gets on one machine? That's actually an interesting question. And in general, you can think about other objectives. That's, that was the general framework that I gave you at the beginning. Uh, so thank you so much. Yeah, for, for greedy, it doesn't work. For greedy, it doesn't work. You have to change the algorithm. For greedy, that 2 plus a square root 2 times k is the bound that you actually get. There is, an hard, there is a tight instance that greedy gets actually 58%, 2 minus a square root 2. So that result is tight for greedy. So you have to do something else. Yeah, actually, for this second result, so, so that thing that I said that opt i of s is inconsistent between different machines, uh, how you resolve it is by sending each item to multiple machines. So it actually helps to get at least to improve the guarantees. Um, but yeah, if you want to get 1 minus 1 over e, you can do that, increase the course size. These are the two main things that, that I think flexibility is okay with. I mean, every other is a kind of flexibility is also interesting. I'm just saying that these two are two possibilities. 